Okay, so once again, I'm Katherine Miller from the Wisconsin Office of Rural Health. I want to welcome you to the second webinar in our pediatric care series with UW Health. We're very proud to partner with them. And I'd like to introduce Dr. Fabian, who is in a, a pediatric emergency medicine specialist at the American Family Children's Hospital. And today she will be presenting on non-accidental trauma, recognizing and reporting child abuse in the ED. And it is all yours, Dr. Fabian. All right, thank you so much. Um, there's, oops, is that showing up for you guys? Or are you just still seeing presenter mode? Okay. Yeah. You still see just the slides, okay. Yeah. Sorry, trying to clean things up. Um, so I, this is a, a topic that, that I've um, talked about many times. It's kind of different groups. And so please interrupt if um, I'm kind of going over some facet of this that is um, I'm not spending enough time there or if I'm spending too much time on something else or just questions come up, I'm happy to answer those as they arise. Um, but without further ado, let's see if I can make my slides. There we go. Um, so today, you know, there's a few things that I want to kind of make sure that we touch on, specifically kind of defining what abuse means for the pediatric population, um, a brief overview of kind of the most common presentations of child abuse that we'll see, um, what a child abuse evaluation entails or what it should entail when they're presenting to the emergency department, uh, and kind of how to document um, concerns for abuse or actual abuse. Um, and then when you have documented it, when you have those concerns, what do you do with that? How do we report um, and who do we refer to for kind of further follow-up? So just kind of jumping into some definitions. Um, there's many different definitions of abuse that you can find. Um, I tend to revert to kind of the federal definition. Every state has a little bit of a nuance to this, but generally the most complicated but overarching way to describe it is any recent act or failure to act on the part of a parent or caretaker resulting in injury to a child um, or failure to act that presents an imminent risk of serious harm to a child. Um, this is kind of the minimum standard um, that the national government has adopted. Um, every state, like I said, is, has some variations and some nuances in their language. Practically speaking, um, when we think or talk about child abuse, um, we think of physical, sexual, or psychological maltreatment or neglect. Um, and they, like I said before, that includes failure to act in the setting of a potential harm. Um, a child maltreatment is, an, is another term that you'll often hear when talking about child abuse, and it's a little bit more of a broader understanding. Um, and it also covers neglect, exploitation, and trafficking, which are not topics I'm gonna go into in depth today, but often do kind of fall into that category of child abuse. Um, in the U.S., we unfortunately have a disproportionately higher rate of violent child deaths relative to um, several of our um, equally medically developed countries around the world. Um, and it's estimated that about one in seven children have experienced some form of abuse or neglect in the last year. And in 2020, there was almost 2,000 children who died of a secondary to abuse or neglect. Um, when we try to break this down by age, you know, which are the highest risk populations, whom should we be looking extra closely um, with when they present to our to us for evaluation, you'll see a very strong younger age predominance. Um, it definitely still happens with older ages, particularly at high risk populations, but the younger you are, the higher um, the likelihood that you may suffer abuse. Um, and if you break that that younger age groups down even further, it's the one and under that really um, overrepresent within the child abuse um, presentations in the US. We know um, there's a lot of studies that have tried to identify what the highest risk factors are for being a victim of abuse. Um, it's been studied many, many times. There's not a great consensus about this, but we do know some factors that make you more likely to suffer significant harm, if not death, secondary to abuse. And as I mentioned before, being young, very young, particularly under one, puts you at much higher risk. Um, males, we know, have a higher child fatality rate. And um, abuse that is manifesting as abusive head trauma tends to be much higher mortality than other forms of abuse. We also know that the more episodes of abuse that a patient is evaluated for, the higher risk that any subsequent evaluation is going to result um, in higher mortality. Um, so kind of that's just the background in the U.S. of, of abuse. Um, and then thinking about kind of what do we see when we're when someone comes into the emergency department or even clinic, um, you know, what are the things that we look for? Um, and, you know, I wanted to touch a little bit on presenting history, although this can be challenging because oftentimes you'll get some of these features in non-abuse situations, but things that tend to kind of um, pique our interest from an abuse standpoint or kind of red flags for us are, you know, very unexplained or vague history of injuries in a young child. Um, um, 
for injuries that are inconsistent with a child's developmental stage. Um, so either you have a child that is developmentally unable to perform certain things, like this child is immobile, but the parents say that they fell off of something, um, or it's a six month old and they're like, oh yeah, they were climbing on something and they fell. Um, that's not, doesn't really make sense for the average child. A six month old should not be able to climb up on anything. Um, if you have multiple people providing stories or the same person that's giving slightly different story over time, that's also a bit concerning. Um, patients that present multiple times with you know, various types of injuries that are all maybe a little bit suspect, or maybe they're all seemingly normal, but they're happening pretty frequently. Um, obviously, if we know about an abused sibling in the home uh, or a child that's abused, their siblings or other children that are in that home are also higher risk for abuse. Um, and kind of going back to that neglect con like concept, unexplained delay in seeking medical care. So if parents, you know, present a child with an obvious fraction, they're like, oh, it probably happened yesterday, but there's very visible deformity and bruising and the child's not been walking. There's, there's some gap in why they presented um, so late for care. Chief complaints that always um, kind of pique my interest and that sometimes get um, lumped together with other concerns um, are particularly in that very young infant group. Um, so excessively fussy, very sleepy or lethargic infants um, or infants that are just intractably vomiting and we don't have a good explanation for, um, those always make me a little bit hesitant to just kind of chalk that up to an infectious process, um, unless there's something else in the exam that suggests it's more infectious. But always have abuse on your radar with those complaints, particularly in the very young. Um, thinking about the most common things that we see um, secondary to abuse, bruising is, is number one across all age groups. Um, it is the most common physical exam finding um, by and large. And generally it should correlate, like bruising patterns that you see on children should correlate to their developmental stage. And there's a phrase, those who can't cruise rarely bruise. Um, basically that means that if a child has bruises on them, it should be secondary to something they were able to generate themselves. So children that are able to start walking or cruising around, those are the children that are likely to fall and have some bruises on their um, you know, lower extremities, upper extremities, foreheads, areas that fall to the ground first. Children who can't move on their own um, should not really have bruises. And that being said, there's about 2% of pre-cruiser babies. Um, so these are babies before they're able to ambulate on their own that presenting for well child checks did have some kind of bruising noted. But as you'll see, kind of the study that, that looked at like children that just presented for their checkups, how many of them had actual bruising that was not concerning for abuse. Um, the older you get, the more mobile you get, the more likely you are to see bruising that's not pathologic. Bruising patterns um, is something else that we kind of look for. Um, I mentioned before that children that walk and can self-mobilize um, are more likely to have bruises in certain distributions. It's the parts of the body that are likely to hit the ground or hit objects when they fall. Um, typically, children um, that are learning to walk are not going to be hitting their soft tissue areas. So their chest and their abdomen, their back um, and their buttocks typically are not hitting the ground with a lot of force. The buttock is obviously an area they hit a lot, but there's usually a diaper there, so there shouldn't be much pattern bruising. Um, there's a couple of mnemonics that we've used over the t over the years to kind of help remember these things, but the most, um, I think, helpful one is kind of the 10-4, the torso, ears, and neck. That's not a place that children typically bruise on their own. It's just a bit challenging to do. Um, and then anyone four years and under that's presenting with kind of pattern bruising is higher um, risk for abuse. And you'll see that little infant outline that's completely outlined um, in red. Um, that's because infants that can't move on their own shouldn't have any bruising. Um, the other thing that I'll point out on this diagram on the right um, that the left ear is highlighted. Um, there's the, the facial structures in the left ear. The left ear is more commonly associated with abuse because most people in the US are right-handed. And so if they're gonna strike a child, they're usually going to hit them in the left ear. Um, always look at the ears on both sides, but the left side, it tends to be a little bit more pathognomonic for an abusive um, episode. The second most common thing that we'll see with abuse in children um, are fractures. And this is oftentimes kind of the, um, pathologic fractures that we'll hear about, or pathognomonic, I'm sorry, um, for abuse. Truthfully, there is no one type of fracture that's pathognomonic. Um, spiral fractures and what we call the bucket handle fracture, the CML, um, which is the one that you're seeing in this picture right here. Um, those are very often associated with abuse, but they are definitely not pathognomonic. And there are situations where toddlers can incur those fractures on their own and not secondary to abuse. That being said, um, in infants and toddlers, abuse does account for up to 20% of the fractures they present to the D4. 
um, thinking about kind of which fractures, if you do find them on um, exam, that would kind of point you more likely to have concern for abuse, um, the CML or the bucket handle fracture, rib fractures, spinous process fractures, and sternal fractures, um, those are pretty challenging to self-induce unless you are subject to very high trauma. Um, so car accidents and things like that can definitely cause um, rib fractures and sternal fractures. Um, as you kind of get down the list of kind of less specific, so linear skull fractures are not very specific for abuse. We definitely see them with abuse, but finding one on exam or finding one in a child that's fallen does not necessarily mean that we need to be concerned about abuse if the story is, is supportive of an accidental episode. Um, these are just some pictures of certain types of fractures that you'll see. So in the, the small hand on the left, that's that bucket handle fracture. You have multiple skull fractures in this um, image, which is having multiple nonlinear fractures is more consistent with an abusive episode. Um, there's a spiral fracture on the right, and then it's a little bit more challenging to see, but the chest x-ray on the bottom has multiple healing rib fractures that you can see kind of on both sides of the chest. Burns are kind of the third big category that we think about in terms of abuse. Um, up to 45% of any genital and perineal burns are secondary to abuse. Um, generally, that's a part of the body that children and adults tend to protect reflexively. Um, and if you think about the way that accidental burns tend to happen, usually they're not directly at that region. Um, there are exceptions to that, obviously, if someone is sitting and they drop something um, like a scald injury from an accidental drop of, of liquid in their lap, they can get burns in those places. But if you see a burn there or a burn that's isolated there, um, have a high index of suspicion for abuse. Um, most commonly, you're going to see kind of submersion or immersion burns, um, sometimes with objects and cigarettes, although that's a little bit less common than we used to see. And I apologize, the next slide is a little bit um, visually intense, um, but I think it's worth kind of pointing out the, the top two images are, those are some immersion burns, and you'll see that well-defined demarcation line between where the, you know, the burn starts and stops, and they're circumferential, similar with the hands. Um, the pattern bruising on the buttocks and kind of these like scab wounds over the face, that's a little bit less common and sometimes harder to, to know to look for. Um, the pattern bruises, I believe someone put on like a, a hot radiator type um, shaped thing. And the, the scabs on the face are actually from cigarette burns in various stages of healing. So those have occurred over time. Abusive head trauma is probably the most dramatic presentation um, of abuse that we tend to see and also the most likely to cause some significant sequelae. Um, medically speaking. Um, oftentimes, um, especially young children will present with fairly vague symptoms. So poor feeding, excessive crying, lethargy, or seizures always have abusive head trauma kind of on the differential. Um, subdural hematoma is probably the most common thing that you'll see um, with the abuse. Um, and an unfortunate number of children that present with abusive head trauma will die or succumb to their injuries. Um, very few of them survive without sequelae. And part of that has to do with the fact that abusive head trauma tends to happen in very young infants um, that are highly vulnerable and their brain is still in the early stages of development. And so there's a lot of potential risk, um, even if they do survive the trauma. Head imaging, um, typically, and we'll talk a little bit about this more, but typically we start with a head CT, mostly because that's going to give us the most information most quickly. Um, but MRIs are also definitely used in this evaluation, but you'll often see um, bleeds, um, epidural, subdural, subarachnoid. Um, you can also see fractures on those imaging, um, cortical contusions, um, and intraparenchymal hematoma is also also show up frequently. Um, sometimes the head imaging is, or sorry, the head imaging, the head injury is not secondary to direct impact. And this is kind of where you get into that shaken baby syndrome, um, where it's actually inertial shearing um, or rotational forces that are actually causing the bleed. And so externally, you may not see much, but they will present with some of those clinical exam findings that are concerning for something going on intracranially. Um, this is just some images of different types or manifestations of intracranial abuse, and you'll see on a lot of these, there's not necessarily a lot of external swelling or findings, um, but the internal um, damage is pretty significant. Retinal hemorrhage, um, a bit more challenging to evaluate um, independently. Oftentimes, we need to reach out to our consults um, with ophthalmology or refer to ophthalmology to get a more detailed exam. Um, but unfortunately, fairly specific, um, especially when you think about severe retinal hemorrhage for the diagnosis of child abuse, um, it's fairly sensitive as well. And so any patient that we have kind of that presents to our hospital as a referral for evaluation of, of 
um, child abuse, particularly at young ages, um, or if there's notable or known um, head abuse. Uh, head trauma, we will have ophthalmology do a, a detailed exam in order to evaluate for hemorrhage. Intraoral injuries, this is another kind of topic that um, we often talk about in terms of being not necessarily pathognomonic, but very suspicious um, for abuse, um, specifically um, frenulum tears. And so what you can see in this picture is that kind of bleeding area underneath the tongue. Um, it's not uh, a, an easily sustained injury in an infant. Um, older children, again, when they start to be more mobile, can fall in certain ways that will potentially injure the frenulum. But again, that's a little bit harder to do. It's a very protected part of the body. Um, and usually injuries there are secondary to objects, pacifiers, bottles, or something else being shoved forcibly into the mouth. Um, very concerning um, if you do are doing an exam and you notice that there's a frenulum tear or there's some injury there, even if that's not the chief complaint or what they brought them in for, ask about it um, because that's that's very atypical for children to develop on their own. Um, so I'm going to pause there because we're going to move on to the kind of ED evaluation. Any questions on kind of the presentations or the patterns of um, abuse that we see? I'll actually start. This is Catherine. Yeah. Um, I was wondering how, and I know it'll vary, but how these children present to the ER because it makes me think so many of them don't get to the ER um, if if it's a caretaker abusing them, and then what incentive do they have to go to the ER knowing that they're going to be in legal trouble? Yeah. Um, could you speak to that a little? Yeah. Absolutely. And so I will say, you know, from personal experience and talking with a lot of my colleagues in a few different institutions where I've worked, truthfully, most there's a few factors that go into this one. There's usually more than one caretaker um, and it's not as common as one might think that that multiple people are involved in the abuse and therefore both try or multiple people are trying to cover it up. Oftentimes um, what will happen is that a child is being abused and there's evidence of abuse and the teacher at school or the daycare provider or the grandmother or the aunt that's not necessarily living with them um, will notice something is, is amiss and bring it up to the family. Unfortunately, a lot of families know that if they avoid presentation to the um, to for medical evaluation, it actually looks much worse for them with child protective services. And so in order to kind of offset the potential ramifications, they'll actually bring their children in. Um, they just aren't necessarily very honest about um, why or how things happened. But they do actually bring them in because they know that if they don't and someone else reports them, it looks much worse. And so that tends to be what happens. It's either somebody else that's taking care of the child that doesn't normally, um, or it's somebody that realizes that if they if they don't bring them in, that there's going to be bigger problems. Or it's also the situation where, it, particularly with the younger infants, it's not always that someone has the, the malicious intent to hurt a child. It's that something happened, they overreacted or they acted aggressively when they shouldn't have. In the moment, they kind of panic, and then later they regret it, and so they bring them in for evaluation, not because they wanted to hurt the child, but they realize that something happened that shouldn't. They just don't necessarily want to admit that they were the reason it happened. Um, so that happens pretty frequently as well, especially with young parents um, or parents that don't have a lot of support. Wow, that's great insight. Thanks. Yeah. Um, anyone else? Um, if you have questions, you can come off of mute while we're on this little break. Okay, great. Well, we can just continue then. We'll see if any other questions come up. Perfect. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the ED evaluation and kind of what um, hopefully it should entail. And again, keeping in mind, there's some variability in terms of recommendations. There's no universal, like this is definitely how you have to do it for every state in every institution. Um, but these are generally things that I think are helpful to have in mind um, when you're doing this evaluation. Um, first and foremost, I would say almost with any infant, but definitely with anyone, we have some concern about like an ambiguous history or ambiguous injuries where that came from. Examine them from head to toe, like undress the patient. You want to see every part of them, um, especially their skin, um, their GU exam. Unfortunately, sometimes you overlook because diapers can be messy and you're like, I, that doesn't seem like what they're complaining about. Check there. Um, unfortunately, we find things um, not infrequently. Like I mentioned before, look at the ears, look at places where you wouldn't expect to see bruising um, and make sure there isn't any. Um, 
Keep in mind, though, there is a differential diagnosis. So, you know, things that look like abuse are not always. And um, our job is not necessarily to make the diagnosis of abuse, but to have a high index of suspicion of possible abuse and to evaluate and report it appropriately. Um, but remember that our, our workup is targeted not just at evaluating the abuse sequelae, but also ruling out or ruling in um, other things that can cause similar appearances. And so, you know, there's a lot of just... Um, intrinsic kind of bone metabolism disorders, there's um, coagulopathies, um, there's different dermatic um, issues that are going to appear like an injury but nece aren't necessarily one, you should still work them up appropriately. Um, labs um, are definitely important, particularly when dealing with very young children, and, and mostly in a lot of ways it's to evaluate for the degree of potential injury, but also, like I said before, to kind of evaluate some of that differential. Um, our lab studies tend to be targeted to, you know, age um, and the type of injury that they're presenting with. So the younger you are, the more likely you are to get everything worked up, in part because you're not that an infant isn't able to articulate any particular event or say where something is focally uncomfortable. Um, so a neonate or an infant, um, particularly under one, um, sometimes even under two, um, if they present with certain types of fractures or bruising or possible head injury, we're going to get all of these labs on them versus a five-year-old that comes in and has very obvious fracture or bruising or is complaining of pain in a certain place or gives you a story that someone did a certain thing to them. We don't necessarily have to do all of the other um, blood work um, and studies. So it's a little bit kind of um, age specific, but generally I would say one and under, you're probably going to be doing all of these, um, particularly when you're thinking about trauma intra-abdominally, um, getting a CMP amylase and lipase on your analysis is going to be helpful because those patients are very um, prone to having more subtle intra-abdominal injuries that we could miss on external exam, at least initially. Um, we talk a lot about kind of what kind of imaging we need to do for these patients. Um, as I mentioned before with some Lutha labs, the younger you are, the more likely we need to kind of check everything. Um, Highly recommend ordering a skeletal survey, which is a specific radiographic study, not a baby gram. Um, baby gram does get a picture of the entire infant, but it does not get the level of detail that is required for abuse um, uh, legal purposes, um, for lack of a better way of saying that. Um, it does not give you enough specificity in terms of what you can see on that um, to really definitively rule out all kinds of fracture. It can show you some obvious fractures, definitely, but if um, there's some fracture seen on a baby gram, they're going to have to go get a complete skeletal survey afterwards. So you're just kind of duplicating their um, radiology. Um, I mentioned before that kind of five years tends to be our kind of cutoff for where children, we expect them to be able to describe um, some type of injury of what kind of mechanism and kind of focus our imaging based on that. Very low yield for doing a full skeletal survey on a child over five that's not complaining of particular pain or injury in a certain place. Um, the exception to that is a child that has significant developmental delays or limited mobility. Um, or unable to like articulate for themselves, um, in part because limited mobility makes their bones more prone to fracture, even if it's not very high trauma. Um, but if they're significantly developmentally delayed or not able to advocate for themselves, they could possibly have pretty significant pain and or injuries, but they can't explain those um, or express those to you. So getting more imaging on them is usually typically how we pursue that. Um, imaging in terms of kind of um, CT and MRI, I think I mentioned this already, but we oftentimes start with a head CT, um, especially with children under 12 months with suspected abuse, even if that abuse appears to be more superficial, if it's just bruising or a fracture, there's a higher risk that they are going to have something intracranial. Um, and so we tend to get, we do get CTs um, and then usually MRIs because you get a little bit more detailed picture and it can look for um, different ages of injury, but that's not necessarily something that has to happen right away. The head CT is gonna give you the most important information that'll affect kind of your ED management. Abdominal CTs is something that our kind of surgical and trauma kind of world is kind of working on research in terms of developing a threshold for um, hepatic enzyme elevation that would trigger reflexive imaging. Um, a lot of institutions will say anything above two times normal. Um, other states or institutions will say anything above 60, above 80, above 120. Um, Truthfully, if you have high concern or if there's any bruising with an associated elevation of AST or ALT, and I would typically say at least um, two times normal is probably a very generous threshold, and you could argue to go lower than that. Um, but if you have any signs of abdominal trauma, I think you're probably best off either getting that imaging or at least discussing it with um, whichever local child protective service you can um, to pursue that. 
Um, a detailed ophthalmologic exam is always included um, with children under 12 months. Any child over 12 months, we kind of narrow that to children that have obvious head trauma. Those are the ones that we tend to look more closely with. Um, sorry, that was a lot of words. Um, any questions about that? And again, I, I apologize that there's not a really uh, well-formulated kind of consensus statement on what imaging or labs to obtain, um, but this is our kind of the trends that we've seen nationally. Um, I'm going to move on to abuse documentation, and I think this is kind of the section of things that gets a little bit more um, maybe nerve-wracking for a lot of providers and, and people that are evaluating children. Um, it's like, how do, we, how do we document the abuse and what do we do with that documentation? Um, remembering that in um, child abuse scenarios, there is a specific HIPAA clause that permits disclosure of suspected abuse, um, and physician, patient, um, or care provider, patient privilege is waived. Um, Medical professionals at any tier can be called upon to testify in court regarding findings um, and regardless of kind of the wishes of the either the victim or the family, um, you can be called upon to kind of discuss what you saw and what you did and all of those things. And so knowing that that is potentially what could be down the line, I think for better or worse, that informs a lot of the decision making we have in terms of documentation and reporting. Um, Things that should always be recorded on patients that are presenting um, with concern for abuse or are presenting for evaluation and a concern for abuse emerges. Um, recording as much demographics that so you need to have a way for someone to follow up with this family, even if they go home. Um, and that does include kind of address or where they primarily live or spend most of their time. Whichever caregiver presented with that patient for evaluation, their, their names and kind of their relationship with the child should be re um, recorded. Um, also, any siblings or other children in the home, and I mentioned kind of one of the risk factors for abuse is if there is a child in the house that has suffered abuse, any other child, re biologically related or not, is also higher risk. And so knowing that there's other children in the house means that we will pursue kind of further workup and evaluation of those children as well. Um, record the specific concern for the visit, um, trying to avoid, you know, editing that kind of later on. So what that parent came in for or what that caregiver came in for, it could be completely unrelated to what you ultimately think is going on, but record what their concern was. Um, other things that are helpful are kind of recording what kind of patient this is. Is this a medically complex patient? Do they need different kinds of medications? Are they on a schedule for feeds? Do they, are they have a history of prematurity? Do, are they behind on their immunizations? Do they have severe allergies? And then some of the basics kind of vitals, obviously, I think we get on everybody, um, particularly in children and toddlers, getting a heightened weight is also helpful. And any child under three months, although one might argue any child under six months, um, but definitely under three, it should, you should record the head circumference. And again, thinking about about kind of manifestations of abuse and head trauma. Um, if there's head trauma that's either been acute or um, previous or repetitive, um, their risk for having kind of um, hydrocephalus or swelling secondary to um, head injury is higher. And so having a reliable head circumference measurement will be helpful. Um, and additionally, kind of um, asking the parent or the caregiver kind of what the neurodevelopmental status is of the child in their general, like, I try to keep the medical history limited in these initial evaluations and our, and our child abuse team kind of agrees with that. Um, we don't need history of every infection they ever had or every ear infection they were ever suspected of having, but just a general, have they ever had any chronic like lung issues? Have they ever been intubated? Do they have asthma? Any cardiac surgeries? Are they developmentally on track? Have any concerns from the pediatrician? Those are kind of like the basic things to, to document. Um, Things that we know um, are a little bit higher risk factors, and these are factors that I don't necessarily always record in the medical chart, um, but these are things that can kind of feed into um, CPS evaluation um, and kind of evaluating that the risk stratification of this family um, or the situation. Um, single parent families or families where they just don't have a lot of support for childcare, um, poverty, um, or family compositions where there's a lot of combined family units um, are a little bit higher risk um, for children being either neglected or abused. Um, in kind of retrospective chart reviews, they've noticed that children that either um, switch their PCPs regularly or, um, in, or have inconsistent follow-up with their primary doctors, especially in the first couple of years of life when they have so many of those well-child checks, or if they have incomplete immunizations and it's not secondary to like 
family choice. It's that they just couldn't get around to getting into the doctor or they were avoiding going to their regular scheduled appointments. Um, that tends to be a bit of a risk factor as well, either suggesting that there's not a lot of stability in the home or for the family or that the family is actively avoiding um, medical evaluation. Um, and then patients that are medically complex, um, and again, this kind of holds true, unfortunately, for all age groups. Um, so it's not just the very young that are medically complex, but even as they get older, if they don't have the ability to advocate for themselves or extricate themselves from a situation, their risk or abuse continues to be quite high. If um, there's a situation where you're very concerned that there's abuse um, and a child makes a spontaneous disclosure, listen to what they say, document what they say, um, try not to lead them down a road of kind of what happened or specific details. Um, keep it as general as you can while obviously like addressing their, their issue. Um, in most cases, it is appropriate to tell whoever presents with the child that either this injury or what we're seeing right now could be secondary to some kind of injury to the child, potentially non-accidental. We need to evaluate for X, Y, and Z. Um, that's the appropriate thing to do. It's sometimes a, or oftentimes a very awkward conversation. I will say most of the time when I've had that conversation, most parents are very receptive to it for a couple of reasons. And the cynical part of me realizes that some of those parents that know that they perpetrated abuse or they know who did um, are trying to be compliant so that they don't raise any red flags um, versus the vast majority of parents really just want what's best for their child. And so they're, they're more um, receptive to kind of further work up if there's a concern for something more serious going on. Um, kind of going back to if a patient makes a disclosure, you have to be honest with them um, that, and usually what I say is, you know, I, I know this is hard to talk about. I have to I have to share this information if I'm worried it's going to put you um, at risk for harm. Um, and even if they really don't want you to, that's kind of your obligation as a, as a care provider. Um, and to the best of your ability, help the child understand why we need to share that and who we're sharing it with. And specifically, you don't have to tell them we told your you know, we're not going to actually turn around and tell their parents what they said, um, but that we need to talk to social worker. We need to talk to our like child protective team because we have concerns about how this injury or how this event happened. It's a it's a challenging conversation um, pretty much always, but um, it is important to have. When documenting, highly, highly, highly emphasize using quotes whenever possible and acknowledging who said what, um, in part because that is one of the best ways to make your documentation um kind of reliable in a, from a legal standpoint and also mitigates kind of how culpable um, you would be to kind of scrutiny later on. So if you, you know, if mom said blank, put quotes around it and say mom said um, or whomever in the room said things um, versus kind of you um, just recording what you remember from the conversation. To the best of your ability, try to use quotes. Um, highly recommend double checking your documentation for accuracy, especially if you're concerned about abuse because people will be reading it and rereading it and trying to look for discrepancies um, and inaccuracies. And so just making sure that you're submitting the most accurate version of events that you can. Um, and again, trying to be as objective as possible. These oftentimes, especially when it's a very concerning presentation or kind of um, obvious um, abuse, it's very hard to kind of distance yourself emotionally from that. Um, but in terms of your documentation, it's going to come off as cold sometimes, but use concrete, very analytic, um, objective terms. Um, try to avoid keeping any kind of feeling or sentiment in there, even if it's coming from the family or other people that are there. Generally speaking, photography um, from a legal standpoint should be done by a law enforcement agency. They have forensic cameras. They have particular ways that they tend to do things. If that's not an option, taking photographs of bruising or injuries is also appropriate to do from the ER standpoint. Um, but just keep in mind that those images tend to be um, accessible to anyone who has access to the chart. Um, and so they're you know, not, I don't want to say public, but they're close to as close to public as it can be. Um, when describing things like burns or bruises um, or deformities, things like that, try to avoid general terms of like there was like diffuse bruising over like the lower extremities. Be more specific. There was like circular ovoid shaped bruising, um, three or four of them over like the posterior buttocks and one was brown colored, the center one was like purple colored, like describe exactly what you're seeing, not just in various stages of healing, um, mostly because that will be more specific. And when someone evaluates that patient again in 24, 48 hours, there's going to be a difference in terms of what you're seeing and what they're seeing. And the best way to identify that is if you describe exactly what you're seeing and it's consistent with progression of um, healing. 
Um, if non-accidental trauma is suspected and the parent or caretaker is changing their story, and I mentioned before, that's kind of one of the red flags, I don't recommend kind of pushing to get a clear story. The more times you ask them to uh, explain exactly what happened and the more people that ask them, um, the more likely it is that someone's going to get clued into the fact that they aren't being consistent and then they are going to change their story to either make it more simple or they're going to kind of stick with whatever they just said and then they're going to it's going to be a little bit harder to figure out what actually happened. What is appropriate to say um, in the charting is kind of parent or somebody initially said blank, um, later said blank, and that's kind of it. Somebody else from a law enforcement agency is going to be more um, reliable from a legal standpoint um, to kind of get the actual story from that from that care provider. Um, the other thing that I recommend um, and that our nurses and kind of our care teams have also advocated for is kind of minimizing the number of people interacting with the family and documenting in their chart. In part, that helps kind of minimize the risk for inconsistencies and makes it a little bit more um, straightforward from a legal standpoint. It also minimizes the opportunity for the family to kind of split and, you know, they may know somebody or they may have a, a better relationship or rapport with someone in the department. And so they're going to, you know, be more open or less open. Um, and I think that it, it can be a little bit convoluting when you um, have so many different perspectives kind of going in. So if, you know, in the course of either a patient presenting with concern for abuse or during their evaluation, a, a concern for abuse evolves at that point, I usually try to discuss with the team, like, Hey, let's, whoever's already seen this patient, that's who's going to keep seeing them is to the best of our ability. Let's try not to introduce kind of new, trainees or things like that um, and to make it give the family more opportunities to either kind of change their story or um, kind of split a little bit and also having less people going into the chart just makes things more straightforward later on as well. Um, in terms of abuse reporting, um, you as a care provider are a mandated reporter, um, which means that it's your responsibility um, if you have concerns um, of any kind to kind of make a report. And filing a report with CPS or with law enforcement does not necessarily mean that the family is going to find out about it, that any action is going to be taken. It just means that someone's going to look at this case again. Um, and there's every U.S. jurisdiction provides immunity for liability for good faith. So if you make a report and it turns out there's a completely reasonable explanation for events, it's not secondary abuse, you're completely off base, no one's going to come back at you and be like, you did the wrong thing. Um, no one has ever done that. No one's going to do that. Um, I'm sure that there's some exception if you kind of consistently report one family for no obvious reason, somebody will look into that. Um, but generally speaking, as a care provider, if you make a report out of some concern that arises, um, even if it's proven later not to be a concern, um, you are not going to be penalized for that. And just to remember that um, the mortality rate from each recurrent abusive event goes up 25%. So the more times you see a patient and you didn't make that call, you didn't have CPS kind of look into it, um, that's another missed opportunity for us to potentially save a child's life. Um, and again, some a lot of what we don't see from our standpoint, you know, we're just seeing this patient from, from one moment. Um, CPS does keep files on all these families. And so it may be that this is the first time that child has presented to this in this environment for this concern. But maybe they've gone to five or six other EDs in the state um, and CPS reports have been filed at all of them. That gives, you know, the law um, enforcement and kind of the child protective team a lot more ammunition to be like, we need to actively do something to protect this child. Um, so even if from your perspective, it kind of seems borderline or it's not that big of a deal, but maybe it is and you've never seen them before. It, it's worth making the call um, just because somebody else might have some more information that we're not privy to. Um, oops, sorry, that's a duplicate flag. Um, the other kind of really helpful um, websites for Wisconsin specifically um, is the DCF at Wisconsin.gov. Um, it kind of walks you through very stepwise who to call and what to do. And, you know, when you when you do call them and make a report, they ask what you're specifically concerned about. They're going to ask a lot of the demographics that I told you, you know, we need to kind of record specifically who the child's with, their addresses or other children in the home. What kind of medical concerns does this patient have at baseline and what are they presenting with? Um, and again, oftentimes they aren't going to necessarily do anything that night unless you, or that day, unless you think that there's like an emergent concern that they need to come and take care of the child emergently. But truthfully, they're going to get the report from you and then they're going to make that call. Um, oftentimes it, there's a little bit of a lag time depending on the severity of the injury or the concern. Um, other really helpful um, websites um, the preventative resources, and this is kind of focused really on providing education to families where you're like, these 
parents are very young, they seem overwhelmed, or they don't have a lot of support, their child is complicated, kind of what things can we offer them? Even if we don't have a concern for abuse in this moment, you're like, this is one of those situations that ticks those boxes for high risk. These are some things that you can provide to them. Um, and then here at UW, we have, um, we're very fortunate enough to have a 24 seven child protective program, um, which you also have access to in terms of consulting. Um, so through our access center, they can reach out to the child protective team um, and you'll get one of our um, dedicated care team, which is either physician or kind of um, nursing support. In terms of how we would approach that evaluation, what our recommendations would be in terms of lab imaging um, and follow-up recommendations. And additionally, I think it's, it's important to know that if you have concern for abuse or there is documented abuse, referral to our program, they can actually see them as an outpatient afterwards and do a more comprehensive medical evaluation. Um, they are able to do um, developmentally delayed adult exams as well. So if you have, you know, non-pediatric patients, but they're pediatric um, uh developmentally, um, then that is something we can also do here. We do not do forensic interviews. Um, so again, that's going to need to go through kind of a more legal channel, um, but they can help you direct you to that kind of the next step in kind of pursuing that as well. Um, and then the last thing I'll end on, I know my time is running short, um, is just to kind of remember the personal, cultural, and professional biases that we definitely have. And, and these are some images that um, kind of always come up. Um, the, the top one there on the left, that's a congenital birthmark, basically, but it can look very suspiciously like a bruise. Um, and there are definitely some ethnic um, and um, genetic backgrounds that are more prone to having these, um, but pretty much anyone can. Um, the two images on the right are actually kind of alternative healing methods. One of them is, is somebody who just had cupping um, done, and the other is a child at the bottom getting coining, which provide, is like a, it looks like very pattern bruising, um, but it's not... Um, abusive. It's meant to be therapeutic. Um, and then kind of that last picture on the bottom is always a case that kind of sticks with me. And this is a professional football player. And you'll have to forgive me. I can't remember what team he most recently played for, but he was convicted of child abuse um, and, you know, was suspended from the NFL and then ultimately taken back. Um, and I, you know, it's one of those scenarios where he's a celebrity, he's well known, he's successful, has all the resources he could probably potentially need. And, still felt that his treatment of a child was appropriate. Um, we also know um, that as pediatricians, at least, um, there's a lot of implicit and explicit racial biases that come in when we're evaluating with concern for abuse. Um, and I think the best way to identify or address those um, is just to know that they're there and to be cognizant that that's possibly informing our decision making. Um, and it, there's been a couple studies that have actually pointed out that having an intact family unit um, or being Caucasian are actually risk factors for missing abuse. And so kind of keeping that in mind as well, that professionals um, are just um, as capable of abusing their children as those that are not um, professional or have higher level degrees and kind of keep that in the back of your mind. And that's kind of, that's it. Um, sorry, I know I'm running a little bit close to the line, but any questions? Not seeing anything in the chat. Does anybody want to come off of mute? Any questions on anything that was presented? Okay, well, I'm not seeing anything. Um, I just, wow, thank you. That was an incredible <laughs> wealth of information. Um, I think the most important thing is if something comes up and you you just don't know how to approach it or you have some concern but are not sure what the next step is, you can always reach out to our our child abuse team. They're very receptive to that and would much rather get a call that they you know don't need to pursue than than to feel like you're kind of stranded out in the community um, without a lot of support. So I think that's kind of my biggest plug locally. And Megan, did you have something to wrap up? I do, yes. Thanks again, Dr. Fabian, for your time and expertise today. And thank you to everyone for spending this almost hour with us. Um, as a reminder, we will be sending out a recording of this presentation, as well as a short survey just to help us evaluate our future webinars. So be on the lookout for that email. And like Catherine said, feel free to share this with your colleagues.
colleagues, we will also be putting this recording on our website so you can check it out there as well. And I believe that's all I have. I do see another chat that came up though. Sorry, I just it popped up and then I lost it. Let's see. Yeah, do you see that? It's uh, what UA findings would be concerning. Um, so it, it kind of depends on what your initial concern for is, but when we think about um, particularly young infants, the potential for intra-abdominal trauma um, with renal injury, um, so we're looking for blood specifically. Um, additionally, obviously, if you have slightly older child and there's a concern for, a concern for um, an STI or sexual abuse, that's kind of the other things that we would check the urine for. Um, the third thing that we kind of reflexively do um, with most of our young children that present for abuse um, or potentially neglect is we do uh, a UDS um, and looking for kind of potential drug exposures. And again, that is more maybe feeding into um, maybe not as up to date as they could be um, ideas of, you know, if, it, if there's an unsafe environment the child is in, they could have gotten into some substances that would be affecting um, kind of their presentation. Also thinking about things like seizures, um, developmental delays, kind of um, whatever they brought were brought into the ED for, potentially the urine um, could give you a reason why they're seizing. Is this a febrile seizure secondary to UTI? Um, did they get into some medication and is there metabolites um, in their urine that are kind of point you to that? that diagnosis. So usually, I mean, in terms of a strictly abuse trauma, we're looking for blood um, in terms of kind of that differential or kind of other things that could be going on in the environment. We're looking at UDS um, and kind of etiologies for, for things like that. You know, that's more clear. <laughs> And we have Terry typing. Um, yeah. Thank you. She says yes, very clear. Yep. <laughs> um, and so for that purpose, this typically doesn't have to be a cast urine unless you're truly worried about some kind of infectious process is the other thing to keep in mind. Okay, with that, I think we can wrap up. And as Megan said, if you can be on the lookout for a brief evaluation that really helps us out with our uh, federally funded grant programs. And thank you very much. Thanks again, Dr. Fabian. Thank you.